Hi everyone, welcome to Lemon.io Talks. I am Maria, your host, and today we have Rakia, an Angular expert who is ready to share tips on boosting your app's rendering performance. Get ready for some serious optimization hacks and feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We love a good chat and even more, the best questions might just snag you a sweet prize from us. Let's get started with our Lemma.io talk on maximizing Angular rendering performance with Rakia. Let's get hyped and make your app lightning fast. Enjoy, folks. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Lemon.io, for having me. It's amazing to be with you and to talk about the fascinating world about Angular and web performance. So we will start by demystifying the world of web performance. Then we will break down the process of rendering and we will identify in this session the symptom and causes of poor rendering performance. But we will not stop at theory. We will have a look at the real world Angular application and we will investigate its performance bottleneck and learn how to fix them. We will conclude, as Maria has mentioned, with the Q&A session, so please make sure to write down any questions that arise as we go along. So before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Rakia, a freelance software engineer with 15 years of experience. I'm a GD in Angular and Women Take Maker Ambassadors. I'm a content creator with over or with about uh, 140 articles on Medium and over 600,000 views. And I also share my experience on YouTube. I also have a Udemy course with over 20 students, and it's about web performance and specifically about memory leaks. So when we talk about web performance, in fact, we are not talking about the single process or a single uh, monolithic concept. We are talking about a complex a tapestry. Firstly, we have load performance, which refers to how quickly resources load on uh, the browser and can be displayed to the user. Then we have runtime performance, and a well-optimized runtime performance ensures that the application stay responsive and also efficient over time after it has uh, successfully loaded. This involves things like JavaScript execution speed, memory usage, and event handling. And the third piece of the puzzle is in fact render performance. This refers to how the app refreshes and renders after interactions like, for example, animations or scrolling. Yes. And uh, so now that we have uh, seen the three pillars of web performance, let's see what is exactly rendering. When we render a web page, we mean that the browser needs to pass the structure of the HTML and understand it. It needs to see the styling and also understand the behavior defined by the JavaScript. Then it will construct the DOM or document object model, which is a tree-like structure representing the HTML. Next, the browser 
will uh, do what we call layout, and it means that it, de it determines each position and the uh, spaces each element in the web page will take. And the last piece in this process is that the browser, the browser will paint the pixels and bring your application into life. So let's see this uh, process in action. And uh, here we have a page that has, in fact, a header on the top, then a subheader, then some elements here in the middle or in the main frame, and it has also a footer. So I will show a demonstration or visualization of uh, the process of rendering on uh, the Mozilla Firefox, and the demo is, is extracted from uh, Ryan Seddon talk at, G at the GSConf 2015. Oh, sorry, I'm just a moment. Sorry for that, but... So let's move on and don't be stopped by this technical. <clears throat> In fact, I wanted to show a demonstration of a video. So the first, what we see here as, uh, and uh, marked with the green colors are in fact the, the different layouts and the different elements in the page and uh, how much elements and items the browser will load and display in order to have in the end this HTML web page. So depending on how much time the browser will need in order to load your page and display it to the user, the user may notice these steps. At the beginning, the navigation begins and it's the time to first byte. Then the first non-block paint on the screen will appear here, as we can see here. Then the navigation will successfully start. After that, the page's primary content is visible. Then the page will look nearly done, which will bring us after that to time to this metric, which we call time to interactive. And it means that the page is visually usable and engageable. And with that, we will come to the end of load lifecycle. This journey is in fact has three key moments. The first moment is if the, uh, something is happening, if, if the web page is useful, then if it's usable. So now let's see the different types of rendering because not all rendering is equal and different approaches can have different impact on the user experience and the performance. The first type is SSR or server-side rendering. Uh, and with this approach, the HTML is fully rendered on the browser and sent to the client. In the Angular realm, SSR is based on Angular Universal, which is a technology that allows Angular to render apps on the server. But by default, Angular renders application, in fact, only on the browser. That's why we need Angular Universal. So SSR or with SSR apps render on the browser faster because the heavy lifting is done on the server. The initial page load time is also shorter than with the other type of rendering. There is also no need for powerful client devices, which is beneficial for end users with low end devices because uh, the heavy lifting again is done on the server. And it's also a CEO friendly approach. Yet, <clears throat> there is a load on the server. 
uh, and also though the, first, the initial page load time may be short, the user will have to wait till he can interact, interact with the page because he needs to wait till the JavaScript will be fully loaded. And this approach may also not work well with apps that manipulates the DOM. So the second type of rendering is CSR or client-side rendering. And with this approach, the browser downloads the JavaScript and then uses it to create and insert HTML into the DOM. This approach is in fact used in modern web frameworks like uh, Angular or other frameworks. And uh, with this method, all logic, data fetching, templating and routing are handled on the client rather than on the server. This is great for applications that need rich interactions and uh, it also reduces the server load because the heavy lifting is done this time on the client side and not on the server side. It also allows you to cache data or state on uh, the client side without the need to go back to the server. Yet the initial load time is uh, high in comparison with SSR because the browser needs to load all the resources at the beginning and it will not depend for the resources on the server. It can also have uh, bad CU metrics, though modern uh, search engine like Google and other search engines are also are in fact improving uh, how to work with CSR applications. This approach also requires powerful client devices. But this is not the end of the story. There are also other approaches that seeks to combine SSR and CSR in order to provide a hybrid model that offers the best of both worlds, of both SSR and CSR. A page may use SSR for the initial page load to improve the performance at the beginning and also to be SEO friendly, then switch to CSR for subsequent navigation and interaction. So let's uh, see now what symptoms could we uh, notice in an application that suffers from a poor rendering performance. If you are in a such case, you may notice long time to interactive. You may also notice sluggish responsiveness when you click on a button, then the page or the action will be not triggered instantly. There will be also layout shifts. I have also a demo for layout shifts, but I think it will not work. Ah, it's working this time. Oh. <clears throat> okay, let me explain it first. So here we have a user uh, that is in the order, order page and he has two buttons. He has to confirm his order or if he is not satisfied with it, then he has to click on the second button here on the bottom, no go back. He sees here the notification. You have selected 56 items. Is this, is this correct? But in his case, this is not correct, that's why the user have to click on the, on the gray button and go back. And when he tries to do it, so as he tried to click on the no go back, this part is displayed on the page. It could be advertisement, in this case, it's also a kind of advertisement, which caused a shift. So the rest of the page is shifted or moved to the bottom. That's why uh, the click here was triggered on the confirmation button instead of the no go back. So the user is frustrated. He tries to click on no go back but 
with no effect and his order is completed and confirmed, which could have some major consequences. So, and the culprit behind the poor rendering performance could be inefficient JavaScript or style sheet, large DOM blocks, unoptimized images and media, too many HTTP requests, lack of caching on the client side, server performance, excessive use of web fonts, or even rendering blocking resources. When you have some big scripts of JavaScript, which will let the browser be busy with, with the loading and rendering them and blocking some other resources that are weighted also to be rendered and handled. As optimization technique, we can reduce the JavaScript execution time. You can also optimize your style sheet, your images, minimize layout thrashing. Layout thrashing, by the way, refers to the cases when the JavaScript uh, repeatedly changes the DOM and forces the browser to recalculate the layouts and the position and dimensions of these elements. In this example, for example, we have a write operation here on the top to change the height, then a read operation and it forces the browser to calculate the layout because after each write operation, because the next read operation may depend on the previous write. And it's an expensive operation that could cause slow rendering and uh, bad user experience and also bad animation. You can also leverage on push change detection if you are in the using an Angular app and also benefit from progressive rendering and or lazy loading. With this, we will come to our case study, which is in fact uh, a real world Angular application that is that has to render a large number of mat form fields. Let me switch my screen. I can see. Okay, yes. <laughs> so here is the application. It's an application of log management. And uh, it has here a table that displays a list of uh, SES field sets. SES, by the way, refers to Elastic Common Schema and it's a standardization effort made by Elasticsearch. So here in this table, when uh, the user click on an ECS field set, he can see its details and also a group of children or nested ECS fields that are attached to the current field set. This list of ECS fields are displayed our ships list. And uh, by default, the first ECS field is selected and its detail is displayed, as you can see here. The user can switch to another feed and see its appropriate details, or he can click on the show all button, which is in fact a toggle button. It can show or hide the details. And when the user clicks on show alls, he will see the details of all the attached or nested fields. However, I have noticed that uh, there is a delay when the number to show the details when the number of fields is a bit big. Let me show it with anonymous system, for example. Here we have just two fields. When I click on show all, so there is almost no 
no delay but when i go to tls it's a field set that has 29 fields so when i click on it it will take three seconds or more to show the details one two three so almost three seconds and this is also not optimal for the responsiveness of the app so let me show the metrics about what happened as i clicked on show all and for this i need to open dev tools then click here on the three dots then go to more tools and then performance monitor when you go to the performance monitor you will see a list of charts the first one is representing the cpu users then the javascript hip size then the dom node and the javascript events you can also here choose to select or uh, to show or to hide some shots so now i will click on the show all and let's see what will happen so we have here a jump on the cpu consumption and the yellow color represents that uh, we have a lot of cpu usage here we have also a jump on the gs hip size and also a jump in the dom node and also the javascript event listeners let's check the other uh, another case which has 60 fields it's thread so i have clicked on show all it's about 13 seconds <clears throat> so there is also a much more consumption of the cpu also another jump in the javascript heap in the dom nodes and in the javascript event listeners and after the rendering will be finished the cpu shout will come down so let's see how we can investigate what is happening here on the performance timeline record if you are not uh, in this tab performance then you have to click on it in uh, the chrome browser and it's a good practice to click on the collect garbage button in order to garbage for garbage collection before you can start record your scenario so i will go back to the tls here and click on it but let's click on the start button to start record then click on tls then click on the show all button okay we have our details let's stop and it will take a moment till the charts and the metrics will be generated as you can see here so here in the bottom you see a summary of what what tasks are done by the browser and 
here we see that rendering it took it's the most expensive task it took over two seconds there is also painting and scripting rendering is represented by the lila color and it's also reflected here on the top i can select just this area in order to investigate it better. So as I have mentioned, the yellow color is for rendering, the yellow color is for the CPU consumption, and this gray color could be for browser idle or for browser doing other system stuff. Here in the middle, you see animation. It's related to the rendering. And let me close it. Oh. And when I scroll down, here under task, you can see what tasks are done by the browser during this period of time. So when I scroll down, I can see things like detected changes, refresh view, refresh child components, uh, refresh view also again, and so on. So I will remove this chart and do it again. Um, on view, which has over 100 fields. It has 100 L fields. So let me first click on the garbage collection button. I can also choose screenshots, which will show me all the screens about the key movement that are that are uh, happening during recording this scenario. So let's start recording and click on the show all button. I hope that uh, the browser will not crash because of this expensive task. Sometimes when you record very expensive tasks and you start recording as well in the same time the browser will need to to invest more resources and it crashes so i will stop So, we have a lot of scripting this time, but also a lot of rendering, about 10 seconds were spent just in rendering the DOM. There is also a lot of lila color here. And you may have noticed that this time the Chrome DevTools have two, uh, took some screenshots. For example, in this, in this period of time, the list of uh, items were not yet, or ACS feeds were not yet rendered. But here, the list was rendered and the list of uh, ships has changed its color to blue because blue means selected and details is displayed. So here, under the performance timeline record, you can find also other insights. So maybe I can 
I need to do it again in order to see it. I will just remove taking screenshots. Okay, and start recording. Click on show all. Okay, stop. Okay, and this is the middle part that I wanted to show. So here you have uh, some shards that also represent the GS here and the number of documents, the number of nodes, the number of event listeners, and so on. I can just choose GS heap in order to see this blue uh, line, which is in fact increasing. And the number of listener is also increasing the number of nodes. The number of DOM is not too big. So this is the second tab in the Chrome Dev Tools that we can uh, leverage or use in order to investigate performance or other web performance related issues. But there is also another features that is related to rendering. So I have clicked on the three dots, small tool again, but this time not performance monitor, but rendering. So, oh, I didn't want to start recording again. So, here when I have this rendering tab, I want to choose paint flashing, select box, and frame rendering stats, which will show me here on the top, some metrics related to the rendering and uh, to the memory consumption. And also on the top, there is different colors. Let's remove this. Okay, yes. Oh, <laughs> and here on the top, there is a metric regarding frame per seconds. Frame per seconds, uh, is a performance matrix that is related to visual applications. And uh, the best rate for frame per second is in fact 60, because the screens of the monitors in general refreshes the screen or displays a new image of the screen 60 times per second. That's why when you, your web app generates a new frame, uh, or 60 frames per second, the user will have a smooth animation and rendering. So, and when I am moving my mouse, you can see that some areas are uh, displayed with the green color, but other areas not. And those areas that are displayed with the green colors uh, are causing or need some rendering tasks. In this case, I see it uh, with the green color because there is an animation here, maybe a shadow that is displayed on her over. Or an example, a tooltip should appear when the user her over this button. So, and when I go to container, for example, and click on show all. So there is some scrolling and also some rendering of the bottom 
part in order to show all the details. That's why we have seen it with the green color. So let's remove this paint flash or this highlight of the repaint uh, zones or areas and see how much resources it will cost us in order to show the 100 elf field groups which are in the geo field sets. I will click on the show all. So at the beginning, we have almost 60 frames per second and almost 200 megabyte used. Okay, now there is a jump to over 200 megabytes and the number of frames per second is dropped down, which is not a good metric, in fact. But when I hide all the details, the number of frames per second will increase again. And the number of consumed memory or used memory will decrease, which is a good, uh, a good sign. So now we will go to the source code of this component and check what is causing uh, this uh, slow rendering and this delay and the time that the user should wait in order to be able to see the list of the days. We will also see how to fix this problem and remove this amount of time that the user should wait in it. So here we are in the ECS feed set component and in the bottom of each template we have two alternative HTML blocks. The second one is the one that we, uh, we should uh, fix or investigate more because the second one will be, will appear on the browser when the open all feeds variable is set to true, which means after the user clicks on show all. Here we have a loop for the whole list of fields and for each one of them, the template shown the details of the appropriate ECS field will be rendered. The first block will be displayed only when the user select on a ship and the user didn't choose to show all the, all the fields. And when I go to the, this nested component ECS field and check it's HTML, let's scroll to the top. You may have noticed that there is a lot of mat form field here because it's in fact a form that is uh, that will be displayed as disabled or enabled depending on the state. I want to show it again on the browser. Okay. Let's remove this. So here when I go to group, uh, when uh, an ECS field is selected per default, it will be displayed as disabled. Then after editing or updating it, the form, the whole form will be enabled or just some fields in it will be enabled. Okay. Let's check how many Mat form field do we have in this form? If I select mat form field, I can see that I have here 28 mat form field in this space, 
the page, but or this template, but this is in fact not the whole truth because on the bottom we have other nested components like lib, ships list, edit ships list, and SES field load values, and so on. And this nested component contains as well other matform fields. So if I just consider the 28 matform field in this SES field, this means when an SES field set has 29 SES fields the, and the user clicks on show all, the browser needs to render to uh, 812 matform fields. And for the 60 fields, the browser needs to render over uh, 1,600 fields. And for the 100L fields, the browser needs to render over 3,000 matform fields, which could explain why the browser was so busy and was blocked just for uploading or uh, checking the state of each matform field and displaying them all. So <clears throat> as a solution for this case, we can check the fields. You can see that it's in fact an input and it's an array of SES fields and it will be given from the parent component. So as a solution, I will define a new attribute. Let's do it here. I will call it lazy fields and it will be an observable So it's an observable of SES field array, and I will initialize it with an empty or with an observable of an empty array. So my solution is uh, to leverage lazy loading and progressive rendering by using RexJS operators in order to gradually emit the list of fields over time in a lazy way instead of loading them all at once. And when the user click on the toggle button, um, it should be toggle, open all fields. So when the user clicks on this button, I will say here this lazy fields, and here I will, in fact, initialize this field. But before I, I initialize it, let me show you how I would initialize it. I will use this function, which takes two parameters. The first one is delay in milliseconds between emissions of items and its default uh, value is 100 milliseconds. The second parameter is concurrency and it's initialized with two and it determines the number of items to emit in each batch. So here in the body of this lazy array function, there is another function that expected a resource observable of arrays because we will give the array of our SES fields as source. And then it will map the source, then merge the emission from the inner observable into outer observables. So when, uh, when this is not the first emission, all the items will be delivered as observables. And when this is the first emission, 
then we will define items, uh, variable, which by transforming items, it's in fact an array, we will transform it into observable by using this from operator from RexJS. Then we will pipe items through several other operators. The first one is buffer count, and it groups emissions into subarrays, each of size concurrency, and concurrency in this case is two. I can change it to five. For example, if I want to emit five ECS fields with each uh, iteration, then I am using concat map in order to map each of these subarrays to a delayed observable, creating a gradual lazy emission of subarrays. So with delay, I am gradually emitting my observable. Then scan will accumulate the emitted subarrays into a single array. And tap will check all the items from the initial array. Uh, it will check whether the, all the items from the initial array are emitted. If so, it will set its first emission to false. So let's go back the, now to the ACS field set component. And here I will say when the user wants uh, click on the toggle or open all fields. I will give lazy fields this. Uh, in fact, off. Is fields. And then. Default. Then I will pipe in order to call my function. But this is not quite correct because when the user click on the toggle open all fields, maybe he wants to hide the details and not to show them. That's why I need to check first whether this all fields is true. Uh, true. And in this case, I will deliver the list of fields lazy loaded. Otherwise, I will deliver an observable of an empty array. Okay. And the last step is in fact to change the template because we are looping through fields instead of fields. So instead of fields, I need to loop through this observable, lazy fields. Lazy fields. And I need to pipe and use the async pipe from Angular. And that's it. Let's check if everything is okay. Okay. There is no error. Let's go back to the browser then. and wait to be refreshed. <clears throat> so here on the console, I don't see any error related to our code. And when I click on TLS, it has 29 fields. Okay. So when I click on open all fields now, 
not the 29 fields should be returned, but just two of them. Then after 100 milliseconds, another two should be displayed, and then another two and another two. If everything is working as expected, then we need uh, we will notice a jump on the browser because after two uh, delivered fields, the scrolling should be updated because the page will be will have more content. So have uh, maybe you have to focus on the scroller. So okay, the scroller is not displayed, but you may have noticed it a bit of a jump. Let me, I can show it better when I go again to more tools and rendering, then I will highlight the areas where some paints or re-rendering will happen. So I click on show all. Uh, I have closed the dev tools. I should let it open. So, and click on it again. So, here you see that There was a green color till all the 29 fields are delivered. So let's go to the one that has 60 fields and its impact threat. And this time, I will open the performance monitor and I will count I will count how much time do we had to wait till all the ships list will be displayed with the blue color well, so we haven't wait we haven't to wait in fact for any seconds it was all of them were displayed with the blue color and the browser was not blocked but it's still in fact progressively loading the list of uh, fields as you can see here we don't have a large yellow block we have a larger block but with jump and come down jump and come down jump and come down and its jump here represents load of another two fields um let me change the two in the lazy array function to five And go again here. We need to wait till yeah, the browser refreshes. So we were in thread. Let's go back to thread again and compare the new chart here in the CPU consumption with the old one which, ha which has uh, concurrency to. So I click on it. We can ignore this first jump because it's just uh, to, in order to display the details of the parent component. And when I click here, <coughs> so, Now we have a larger block and there is not 
so much spaces between the time of come down and jump because now we are loading five feeds each time and let's change it again to two and check the worst case which is geo with 100 l uh, nested fields so geo So the last time we had to wait for 13 seconds. But something like this, you know, the to have all these buttons uh, selected and the list of the days will be displayed. So now they are selected with the blue color instantly. And when I scroll down, I can see that the next details are still be loaded or they are in loading. And whenever two more fields come, the scroller jumps to the top and the CPU consumption also jumps a bit. So this will take a moment till all the 100-elf SES feeds will be delivered, but the rendering is split into small tasks in order to remove that the browser will be blocked and this way, the, uh, the responsiveness of the application is optimized. So let's close the performance monitor and go again to the performance timeline record. I will close the details of GEO and go to thread with 60. fields and open the performance tab, click on the garbage collection button and start recording. Click on show all. So the scroller is still jumping to the top because there is still progressive loading. And when I reach the bottom of uh, my ECS fields and the next two items are not yet delivered, then you may see its place with gray color, something like this. So, yeah. That's what I wanted to show. But it's done now. So stop. We are almost at the end of our session. I will just show you the result here. Hi, hi, Rakia. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what uh, I wanted to show, but <laughs> yes. Can I take a few okay. seconds? Of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Take your time. This is the last thing that I wanted to show, actually. 
if you remember the previous uh, chart here in the performance timeline of the code was a large block with the lila color and the yellow color on top of it but now it's split it into many blocks which uh, let the application to be more responsive and allowed us to remove the the block or uh, the block time of the browser so the rendering took less time as well for this uh, well, uh, this ses feed it was the last time about 10 milliseconds i think now it's much less and that's it <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rakia. Uh, now, guys, you have uh, your time to write down a couple of questions. And until then, we already have a couple. Mm -hmm. So will this video be saved? Yes, it will be saved. And we added a link uh, to the webinar uh, in the section with uh, comments and the actual questions regarding your um, lecture is, is there a way to emulate a device to see how it performs? Uh, we are developing now an app that would mostly be used on fonts. So yes, of course you can emulate actually uh, devices. You can also, so there is more than one way to do it. There is some, uh, some places here in dev uh, tools to choose throt yeah like this <laughs> i was looking for it i have clicked on this setting icon you can uh, choose for example the network slow network or good network you can choose also the cpu you can also yeah this is what uh, the person who asked the question i think uh, me mm -hmm. And uh, you can also, on your uh, device, on device, if you have maybe 30 open tabs and a lot of installed uh, uh, extensions and so on, you can also emulate uh, these situations. You can also, in order to uh, uh, check uh, the worst case scenario, you can also stay playing with your application without clicking on the refresh button and see how it will perform after amount of time without uh, garbage collection and so on. Because when you refresh, then some memories will be consumed memory will or, uh, or a load memory will be removed by the browser and after refresh, the performance will improve but not all uh, real world and users refresh the tabs frequently. Mm -hmm. I think that answers the question. That was actually a really, really interesting question. Thank you, uh, Joaquin. Hopefully I pronounced your name the right way. And the second one is, how did you choose 100 milliseconds value for your function? Could it be zero or, for example, should it be five, 500 for support of older devices? Actually, you are uh, free to choose any number you can you can choose for your case. In my case, I wanted to improve the responsiveness of the app without letting the user uh, noticing that he needs something, for example, and uh, it's not there. So if um, so, let me go back to the browser and close the Dev Tools. If I am the real user and I click on TLS, and then I want to see uh, the list of uh, all uh, SES fields, when after 100 milliseconds, just two fields will be delivered, it's okay for me as an user, and I will not notice just uh, in this 100 milliseconds that there are also some other details on the on the bottom that are not yet displayed because I need to scroll to them and when I scroll they will be uh, already there because <clears throat> I need 100 
milliseconds or much more in order to scroll down. So this is an, uh, an improvement for the performance, but no uh, negative uh, impact on the user experience. It depends on your case. You can decide if, uh, for example, 500 milliseconds fit well for your case or not. Maybe I can uh, uh, I can mention another case. Oh, I need <laughs> each time to click here in order to. So maybe this is also an example. Let's say I am uh, doing here an instant search, and I, as user, I am typing, for example, client, and when I tip on client without uh, the need that I click on the search button or without the need that I uh, push the enter uh, key on my keyboard, I need to see the result instantly. But when you fire your search function on uh, your source code, after each time the user clicks on uh, type on a key, this will uh, degrade your performance. That's why it's it's recommended that you wait, for example, for 300 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. Maybe the user is still typing. He wants to type client. But if you wait just for 100 seconds and fire your search, then you will fire the search maybe three or, four or five times till he types uh, client. That's why in this case, 500 milliseconds or so to fire a search is recommended. It's like mm -hmm. in Google. when you type in Google, you see result instantly. But maybe there is a, not instantly, but maybe there is a delay of 100 or 200 or 300 milliseconds that the user not notice with his own eye or something. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, this question inspired me to the one that we were discussing before the meeting. Uh, what types of tests can be used to actually measure uh, app performance? So there is different type of uh, tests. In fact, they are they are related also to the different type of uh, performance. There is load test, which is uh, the time between the moment the user called the app and he can start use it. If there is some load issues, then he needs to wait for one second or two or uh, a few seconds till everything will be displayed. But if you are online and if you are an e-commerce or application also, just one, one second, it will cost you a lot of money. That's why you have to optimize your uh, load uh performance and for that you can use the load uh, uh, test there is also runtime performance some issues you will not notice it's not easy actually to notice them as a developer when we are developing and refreshing the page and checking it because end users do not refresh it generally very frequently they stay on the application and uh, use it for a few hours and the amount of uh, used memory will increase and increase and increase, which will cause the app to be slow and sluggish. For that, we use uh, uh, runtime performance. There is also other kinds of uh, uh, test and performance, like, uh, uh, as I have mentioned, rendering performance. Mm -hmm or uh, stress performance, network performance as well, for that you can use, for example, this network tab, and, yeah, and capacity performance as well, when too many users or end devices or end uh, client are using also your application and uh, Maybe this will cause some load on the server, but maybe a load on the server will uh, influence also how the responsiveness on uh, the client side. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for responding or and for sharing so many interesting hacks here. 
Uh, I guess we have just two questions for now from mm -hmm. our audience, Kishroom and um, uh, in tracking, uh, which question did you like uh, the most? Who should receive our awesome merch from <laughs> Lemon.io? So all of them are good questions, in fact. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> maybe the one with the delay. But it's, uh, I haven't, I can take, yeah, it's in fact a good question because it does not, uh, it does not, uh, it's not just related to our case today or for the search case, it's related to many other cases. Mm -hmm. So, and okay. for that, there is some uh, RexJS operators. Yeah, I will choose this one. <laughs> with the delay. <laughs> okay, then what we're going to do, uh, we're going to reach out to that person and ask for details and send you our merch. And I guess that's it for today. Uh, Rakia, thank you a ton for coming to us and sharing your insights. Thanks to everyone who were joining us today. And if you're not a part of our community yet, uh, please apply. We are always happy. And let's uh, meet each other on our next Lemon Eye Talks. Thank you for having me and for having this opportunity to share my experience online. Thank you.